So welcome everyone uh, to our Open Science course and Reproducibility Journal Club. And um, today we have uh, Leonard Held. Um, and Professor Held is a department chair and professor of uh, biostatistics at the University of Zurich. And he is uh, also Open Science Delegate and Director of the Center for Reproducible Science uh, at University of Zurich and a steering committee member of the Swiss Reproducibility Network. His current research focuses on the design and analysis of uh, replication studies. And he will talk about combining significance and relevance to assess replication study uh, success today. And uh, without further ado, please welcome Professor Held. Thank you, Chupa. Um, um, so warm welcome and thank you for inviting me to speak here. Um, I forgot to ask, how much time do I have? Uh, half an hour to 40 minutes. Okay, okay, thank you. Um, okay, I'll, I'll try to stick to this. Okay, so my, my topic is about combining significance and relevance and, and uh, with particular focus on replication success. Um, yeah, and, and this is work funded by SNSF, so Swiss National Science Foundation. And um, so um, I want to start with, you know, the notion of the clinically relevant difference, because that's what usually is, is um, comes to mind when you think about um, relevance rather than significance. And so that's what you use in, in sample size calculations. And uh, the clinically relevant difference is defined as the smallest difference of the primary outcome variable that clinicians and patients would care about. So um, that is, as you know, a bit difficult um, to elicit from experts. And so I found this quote here from Stephen Sen in his book, Dicing with Death, um, that states, the medical statistician assigned to help design the trial is given a license to drive the physician crazy by pestering him or her for this clinically relevant difference. Um, so, but as you, I guess many of you know, this is a, a crucial component in, in standard sample size calculations um, for clinical trials, even if it is um, difficult um, to elicit. Um, so for example, you may just have a continuous outcome and here your clinically relevant difference delta is 0.25 and you set a few other input variables. This is R code. And then you know this function power.t.test gives you a sample size of 55 in each group, which is sufficient to achieve a certain power which is 90% in this case. Now, um, there are some peculiar features about sample size calculations based on power. And, uh, and one thing that is particularly striking relates to what's called the minimum detectable difference. So that's something different. That's not the clinically relevant difference, but the minimum detectable difference. And this is defined as the smallest difference that will lead to a significant result. And obviously this depends on the sample size. And you may wonder, well, how large is the minimum detectable difference if, if I do a proper sample size calculation? And um, for example, I power my study um, at 80% to detect some value of delta. And the surprising thing is, if you look at this plot, is that um, the minimum detectable difference is usually smaller than the clinically relevant difference. And it depends on the power. This is here on the x-axis. And the larger the power, the larger the difference is between the clinically relevant difference and the minimum detectable difference. So that's a peculiar feature, which is a little disturbing because that means um, you may get a significant result, although your estimate is smaller than the clinically relevant difference that you used in the power calculation. And sometimes um, people misinterpret this as um, that your trial was overpowered, but this is actually not true. So you can get this phenomenon 
for you know a standard setting of 80 or 90 percent as you can see here in this plot so um the two quantities are equal if the power is only 50 percent but that's nothing you really aim for right so a power of 50 percent would be much too small to to sell to regulators and and the usual numbers in in clinical trials are 80 or 90 percent so that's interesting because clinically relevant differences are also called minimal clinically relevant difference so you might think um the statistical procedure will only be significant if your estimate is larger than this minimum clinically relevant difference but that's actually not the case it can be smaller but still significant so we see already this this trade-off between significance and relevance that i want to talk about here in in uh, today now um people in pharma are, are well aware of these issues and um recently um there was a um a, a paper published um here in clinical trials 2018 suggesting to combine the two things to combine statistical significance and clinical relevance and basically to look at both um in in a clinical trial in a phase two clinical trial those are by the way actually partly authors from basel i don't think they are present here but um that's actually just a side comment okay and so this dual criterion as it's called requires both significance but also relevance so that means relevance means the effect estimate theta head needs to be larger some decision value so there is another value that you need to specify dv the decision value and you only in a sense flag success if your estimate is large enough larger than the decision value and also significant and then you can you can look at the math and you you can derive the the smallest sample size where relevance ensures significance so that's in a sense like a sample size calculation and yeah the funny thing is this no longer depends on power so you can do a sample size calculation without specification on power and um and these dual criterion designs are actually not so rare they actually occur in in um in in a lot of um um regulatory approvals so the most prominent example are, are COVID-19 vaccine applications so we, which um, you know uh, have been approved a lot over the last years where quite often there was this dual criterion that on the one hand the lower end of the 95 percent confidence interval um was required to be larger than 30 percent efficacy so that's in a sense the significance and um, criterion for um a reference value of 30 percent but on the other hand they also required to have the point estimate larger than 50 percent efficacy so that's the relevance criterion right so you see in in COVID-19 vaccine um approvals actually also such a dual criterion was used at least implicitly okay so what are the outcomes and decisions for a dual criterion design this this um figure is taken from this paper um from clinical trials to to understand the figure it's important to realize that um, they now talk about hazard ratios um, and the hazard ratios um, are ideally small rather than large so we have to um, reorient our um, our view and now we want smaller theta so the smaller the better smaller values are preferred and and this is what you see here in this plot so one a hazard ratio of one is the reference value um, where you check for significance and then there is this decision value dv which is let's say 0.7 so that will be a reduction of, of 30 percent and now four types of things can happen um the plot shows four different confidence intervals so in the first one the result would be not significant and not relevant right so that would be no go in in this um, two by two table here on the left 
The next one, the result is significant and it's relevant. So that's actually what we want to achieve. So that will be go, evidence of relevant efficacy. Um, so, third question from the public. Um, yeah, let so me just finish this. this. Okay, yeah. Yeah, go ahead. Um, um, and, and, and finally, um, there are three, uh, two inconclusive um, categories where it's either relevant but not significant or significant but not relevant. Okay, so you see it gets a bit more complicated. It's not just significant yes, no, but it's actually all combinations of significant and relevant that may occur. Right, so the question was, what does 50% efficacy mean? Yeah, thank you, David, and, and hi, by the way. Um, yeah, vac vaccine efficacy is, is um, defined um, similarly, I think, as a, as a relative risk. So I think it means um, that the, the risk to um, still um, get the disease being vaccinated is um, at least 50% smaller than um, without the vaccine. I think this is how vaccine efficacy is defined. I hope that helps um thank you yeah you're welcome um right um so this is this dual criterion and um you may wonder now well if i don't have to specify the power for this dual criterion what is actually the power of of such a study if i use a particular sample size and and the power is actually implicit and and this is a figure taken from this recent paper by um Rosenkranz, um, and it's it, it's shown here um, in this plot. And remember, again, the smaller the better. But the smaller the hazard ratios on the x-axis, the the, um, um, the better the treatment. And um, and so you see two lines. The red line is with a sample size of fifty-two, and the the blue line is with a sample size of seventy, so larger than. Um, 52, and and so you see, if we ask, if we have a hazard ratio smaller than this decision value, then the power increases with sample size. But somehow surprising, if we have a, a true value above the decision value, so between 0.7 and 1, then actually the power reduces with um, sample size. And if we are exactly at the decision value, so if the true hazard ratio is 0.7, the value we pick for relevance, then actually the power is always 50%, no matter how large your sample size is. So that's also a peculiar feature, which, which is interesting and in which is different from standard sample size calculations. Um, yes. Um, as I promised, I want to bring this a bit further and, and now um, move um, to the replication setting where we not only consider one study, but where we consider um, two studies, original and replication. And uh, over the last years, a lot of replication studies have been conducted in, um, in, in various fields. You see uh, some of them listed here um, at the bottom left. And um, the, the most recent one, perhaps, was the one in preclinical cancer biology um, that was published, I think, um, in December 21 last year. And, um, and what's usually reported in, in these uh, replication projects are pictures like the one shown here on the right. So what we see here is on the x-axis, the effect size of the original experiment. And the effect sizes are oriented, they are all positive. So you see all the effect sizes are positive. They are between zero and five for this particular figure. And then on the y-axis, you see the effect size, the estimated effect size at replication. So all these experiments have been replicated independently in a different lab. That was a huge, um, project, I think it lasted over eight years, and they looked at, at, at dozens, if not hundreds of, of studies. Um, and as the figure shows, the effect sizes at replication turned out to be much smaller than at original. So there's a lot of shrinkage. They might even be negative. They go in the, in the wrong direction compared to the original effect estimate. 
And, and that's a typical feature of these replication projects that you have a lot of shrinkage that the effect size at replication is smaller than at original, at least on average. Um, and so you see already that if you look at these replication studies, then effect size is an issue. That's what people look at. They not just look at significance, but they also look at effect size and they look at relative effect size. So they look how much does the effect size change from original to replication. They also look at significance and this is indicated by the colors here. So um, the, the red, um, circles are, um, I think, non-significant replication studies and the, the other ones are significant ones. And so you have this, um, the usual pattern that um, some of the studies are along the diagonal where, we, where you would like to have them. So basically replication effect estimate is similar to the original one, but actually the majority of studies has a replication effect estimate much smaller than and original. Right, um, so question is, how can I combine significance and relevance now in the assessment of replication success? And, and what's done in these projects is actually they apply several methods um, to assess replication success. And one of them is, is the famous two trials rule which just looks at significance basically. So that name comes from um, drug regulation and it originates in a requirement from the American regulators from the FDA. And they require usually at least two adequate and well-controlled studies, each convincing on its own to establish effectiveness. So that means if you are, um, well, if, you, if, if a drug company, if a pharmaceutical company um, conducts uh, phase three studies to investigate whether a new treatment works, the regulators usually want evidence from two studies, independent evidence that the drug works. Okay, and so this is much stronger than just requiring one significant result in one study, they want actually to have it replicated in a second study. So it's also about replication. And in practice, this is usually implemented by just requiring one-sided p-value smaller 0.025, so half the usual 5% level. Why, why do people use one-sided um, p-values? Well, you, you don't want to have um, the second study to be significant in the wrong direction, right? So you wanna make sure that the direction also goes, um, that the effect estimate goes in the right direction in, in both studies and therefore it's convenient to work with one-sided p-values and that's actually what I do in the following. And so you may wonder a little bit about this two trials rule um, whether this is really the best you could do because um, I call it double dichotomization. So you, you basically to take two p-values and check whether the two are smaller, your threshold alpha may not reflect the available evidence. So for example, if both p-values are 0.024, that would be a success. But if one is just slightly above 0.026 and the other one is very small, 0.001, that would actually lead to no claim of success. Although you could argue that the second case actually provides more evidence for a treatment effect than the first. So we have to look a little bit um, into alternatives. And um, before I look into this in more detail, just a comment of this um, really well, famous paper by Steve Goodman a long time ago, 1992, um, which was really puzzling when, the, when I first read it um, a while ago. It, it's called a comment on replication p-values and evidence. It's just a, a five pager or so. So it's a short paper where he notes that um, if you have a significant study, just borderline significant, this is a two-sided p-value here, 0.05, and you repeat exactly the same study under identical conditions, same sample size, um, then 
in the absence of any questionable research practices. So if everything goes well, the probability that the second trial is significant is just 50%. And this is something which is still, I think, surprising to many practitioners. Basically, that means, you know, if you just have a borderline significant result, the probability that this replicates is only 50%. And as you can see in this figure, it only slowly increases this probability to larger values if your p-value is smaller and you need the p-value has to be as small as 0.005 to reach the, the usual standard of 80% power. So in a sense, we should not be surprised if, if a replication with the very same sample size um, is not significant. And because of that, quite often in these replication projects, the, the sample size at, at, um, of the replication study is selected larger, considerably larger than at original, because then um, we are able to increase the power to more reasonable values. Um, right. Um, so that's just kind of a side comment here. Replication power, uh, a fascinating topic. And, and yeah, I put the reference here and I've also sent um, um, the slides um, to the organizers and so that you can read the papers um, yourself. Right, going back to this um, topic combining significance and relevance, the question arises, well, can we apply the dual criterion also for replication studies? And um, Gerd Rosenkranz has looked into this and published a paper on this last year replicability of studies following a dual criterion design. And uh, I don't have the time to go into detail, but he looks also at this um, replication probability, but now across both studies, original and replication. Um, and you see actually in this plot that the replication probability can become quite small. So for example, if the true hazard ratio is 0.7, this is again, the decision value in this example, um, then the probability to reach 80% replicability rate is, is just slightly above 10%. Again, a reference for those of you who are interested in this that I would recommend um, further. But this is an approach um, to bring the two things together, significance and relevance. And uh, an alternative approach um, was actually proposed by myself a few years ago. Um, and I want to briefly discuss this over the last minutes of this talk. So this is um, a bit of complicated construction to assess replication success. And I'll explain to you in a minute how this works. And as an outcome, we get something called um, the skeptical p-value that quantifies the degree of, of replication success. And so how does this method work? Well. Look at this plot. This is basically all you need to understand. So we have the original study with an estimate of 0.4 and a one-sided p-value of 0.011, right? So that's significant in conventional terms. And now in step one, we do what's called a reverse base analysis. So we ask, how skeptical do we have to be to make this significant result no longer significant? or to make this convincing result no more longer convincing. So we combine the data from the original study with a skeptical prior that you see here in red, which um, is centered around zero. And it can be quite wide or it can be very narrow. And the more narrow it is, the more it will shrink the original result towards zero. And now we pick the variance of that skeptical prior in a way such that the posterior, and so this is a little Bayesian perspective here, such that the posterior is in quotes, just no longer significant, right? So you see here the posterior in blue and, and, and th that actually crosses now, the lower limit is equal to zero. So what does that mean? Well, that basically just means um, there's a skeptic and says, I don't trust your result because if I apply that particular amount of skepticism to your result, then your result 
is no longer convincing, right? And so in step number two, we now have to convince the skeptic that he's wrong, that his prior assumption is wrong. And in step number two, the replication study comes into a play, which you see here on the right. So for that particular example, the estimate was actually smaller, was 0.15. It was still um, conventionally significant because the sample size was increased a lot. But what we do now is we assess whether there is conflict between the replication effect estimate and this skeptical prior. And that's a bit of a special topic, how to do this properly with statistical techniques that's not in the standard toolbox. Um, so you, you need to calculate something which is called P-box because it was proposed by George Box many years ago. And it's basically another p-value. And if the p-value is small, then you have evidence of conflict. So for that particular example, p-box is actually pretty large. It's 0.31. There's no conflict between the replication study and this prior of the skeptic. And that means we don't have replication success, right? That's basically how it works. and. Um, and you can play around with this and now do this at any significance level you like. I did it here for the usual two-sided 5% or one-sided 2.5% level, but you can do this at any level. And then basically the, the smallest level where you get replication success that defines um, this skeptical p-value. And that skeptical p-value has quite nice properties because it combines significance and, and relevance in, in one criterion, as we will see in a minute. Um, yeah, so let's compare skeptical p to the two trials rule. And th this is what we did in, in, in this paper here. And to do this, we take uh, a different perspective because we need to, um, bring the two methods on the same page to compare them. And to bring them on the same page, we need to assess replication success in terms of the relative effect size. So that means um, we, we look at the success region as a function of a relative effect size. You see this in a minute. So um, maybe it's easier to understand if I show you this, this picture. So suppose um, your sample size was a half. So that means the replication, si uh, replication study was half as large as the original one. Then the green areas here are those areas where the method would flag replication success. And this is shown as a function of the original p-value on the x-axis and the relative effect size on the y-axis. So what you see is um, on the left, the skeptical p-value, and you see you have to have a pretty large relative effect size um, to achieve um, replication success with this method. And on the right, you see the two trials rule, which is a bit more liberal. So the area is larger, but has this cutoff at 0.025 because we require the first study to be significant. And as I said, this is for a sample size of a half, the original sample size. And in the following figures, I now show you what happens if we increase the sample size. So what happens if we increase uh, the sample size to one? Then you get this, two, five, 10, 100. And, and you see something interesting. You see for the two trials rule, the success region actually goes down to zero. So that means your effect size at replication can be as tiny as you want. If your sample size is large enough, you still have success, right? And that's the usual thing people complain about um, significance that it doesn't take into account relevance, right? So you, you may have replication success. You may have a significant finding at replication, even if your effect estimate is very small. And the nice thing is actually skeptical P doesn't have that property. So skeptical P actually um, 
converges to this um, um, dashed line here and any value below that line will never uh, lead to replication success, no matter how large your sample size is. And therefore, skeptical P, that's basically the promise I made earlier, also takes into account the, the relevance of, of the effect estimate. Right. Um, technical note here. Um, I mean, if you look at those two areas, you'll note that the success region of skeptical P is, is smaller than the two trials success region. And this is actually the case for every value, for every sample size. So you can recalibrate the procedure and that's what we've done here um, to be a bit more open. And, and this is what we've done here. So um, the left is the original proposal and the right one is what we call the golden skeptical p-value. And whereas on the left, it's impossible to achieve success with a convincing original result, a borderline convincing original result. So if the original p-value is just 0.025, um, with this recalibration is actually possible as long as your relative effect size is larger one. So as long as you don't have shrinkage. Um, by the way, why is it called golden? That, that's more a mathematical detail. It's, it's quite, quite neat that and this recalibration involves the, the golden ratio, a famous number in mathematics, and, and therefore we, we called it golden, but that's just really a side comment. Right, um, how does it work? So this is an application to cancer biology, to the data from the project I mentioned earlier. And, um, and the data is available, so uh, kudos to, to the uh, Open Science Foundation. They conducted this huge replication projects. And, and I picked out only the studies which reported hazard ratios as effect measures. Now they are oriented positively, so the larger the better. And there are six studies um, with hazard ratio as effect measure, and you see um, all of them have a lot of shrinkage. So for example, the first one, there's shrinkage from a hazard ratio of nearly 26 down to 3.8 at replication. The next one is 10 down to 1.4, next one four down to 1.1. And actually the other three, um, it's, it's one or even below one, the hazard ratio at replication. So it goes in the wrong direction. And Therefore, this relative effect size D is smaller one and it can even be negative. And so just to cut this short here, um, here are the P values, PO and PR at original and at replication. And you see actually the two trials rule and skeptical P, they come to the same conclusion. So they both would only lack success of the first study Skeptical P is 0 0.009. And the two trials rule is also fulfilled, as you see from um, those two p-values. And all others are basically replication failures. And that was actually uh, a general feature in that replication project that only a small proportion of, of those results from preclinical um, cancer biology uh, could have been replicated. Right, um, so skeptical P has some nice properties. It combines um, relevance and significance in one criterion, as we just saw. Um, but you may wonder, you know, if you come from a more traditional background, um, what are the operating characteristics of this? So what is the type one error rate and, and what is the power of, um, of this new method? And, and, um, and this plot shows you the type one error rate and the power across both studies. So not just for one study, but across both studies. And, uh, and let's look first at the type one error rate. So you see the, um, the, the horizontal line, that's the type one error rate of the two trials rule, two TR, that's the two trials rule. And that's 0.025 squared. 
because we have two studies, right? So it's much smaller than 0.025, it's 0.0625, and it doesn't depend on the, the sample size. And then, you know, the golden line, this is the type one error of, um, of skeptical P. You see, actually, that depends a lot on the sample size, but as long as the sample size of the replication study is um, and larger than at original, actually the, the type one error rate is smaller than this reference value of the two trials rule. And at the same time, if you go to the right plot, the, the power, we call this project power because it's across a project, across both studies, is increased. So um, if there is an effect, actually it's more likely to be detected with skeptical P rather than um, the two trials rule. So this is um, encouraging, but um, you may wonder, well, do I really want a procedure where the type one error depends on the sample size? And I think it's legitimate to say, yes, I want this procedure. But you may also ask, can I somehow adjust the procedure to get exact overall type one error control um, for every possible sample size? And that's something we worked on recently, um, and this is outlined in, in this paper. This is a bit more technical. And I just wanna briefly tell you, yes, it's possible. And, and you get kind of an alternative to the two trials rule that you see um, summarized here in this figure. So here, this is a figure, original and replication p-value on the x and y axis. So the two trials rule is just this square. If you are in this square, then you have success. And then the colored lines are uh, the success region below the line um, of this um, controlled skeptical p-value. In, in practice, um, maybe we go first to this um, table. It actually isn't that different. So here you see in the last column now, the controlled skeptical p-value, and you see the golden one in the penultimate column. And you see they are fairly similar. Only for the very first study, the controlled one is, is well, half the size of the golden one. But even here, um, it doesn't make a big difference. But the um, downside of controlling, exactly controlling for type 1 error control is, and is that um, the method no longer reacts to relevance as the golden does. So this is what you see here in this plot. So this shows again the success regions for the relative effect size. And now the controlled skeptical P is much similar, much more similar to the two trials rule. It goes beyond the 0.025 level and then has kind of an asymptote. But um, in a sense, by controlling, by exact controlling the type one error, we actually lose this nice property that the golden one was also um, taken into account. Relevance. So I would say it's actually not possible to have both. Either you have exact type one error control, but then relevance is gone, or you wanna take into account relevance, but then there's no way to exactly control the type one error rate. So um, there's a question, what does relative sample size mean? Yes, yeah, sorry, I didn't say that. And um, so that always means the sample size of the replication study compared to original. So if the relative sample size is two, that means the replication study is twice as large as the original one. I'm sorry, I should have said this um, earlier. But don't confuse it with the relative effect size, which is shown here. This is the effect estimate at replication compared to original. So that's basically all I wanted to say. I hope that wasn't too technical. It's, it's a bit technical, I apologize, but um, um, here's my summary. And um, so th this new method, which is by the way, available in an R package on CRAN, so you're welcome to to use it, the package is called replication success, is a new quantitative indicator of replication success, which avoids this double dichotomization. So it's allowed that one study can be above the, the magic threshold, but you still get um, 
success. And it combines hypothesis testing and estimation. It requires both studies to be convincing and also has an implicit minimum relative effect size, at least the golden one has. And it has exact type one error control, at least the controlled one has. So this is the trade-off here. Either you have the first or the second. What I didn't have much time um, was to talk about sample size calculations, but very briefly, you can also use this method to do sample size calculations as you would do in standard sample size calculations. So you can specify the power that you wanna achieve given you have a result at original and then you can calculate the required sample size for the replication study. Right. Um, yeah, that's my last slide. So thanks for the attention. I hope um, you got something out of it and I look forward uh, to the discussion. Thank you.